Welcome everybody to our live webinar on five five risks uh, facing US offshore wind, which I think is is really well timed as it does feel as though we're at the start of something quite exciting now. As as we can see in the media, Vineyard Winds looks to be making good progress, having publicly announced many of the key supply contracts. To those less familiar with uh, with Vineyard Winds, um, it's going to be the first utility scale offshore wind farm at 800 megawatts comprised of by 62 Allied X turbines produced by GE. So um, yeah, Gary is going to be representing GE today. So I'm very pleased to have, have him on the panel. The expectation is that after a relatively slow, slow burn and several full starts, um, many of the hurdles that Vineyard Winds has to over, had to overcome have, uh, have now been successfully navigated. Um, and then the next project should face a more streamlined, a more streamlined process. Uh, the belief that the industry is at a turning point also comes from the messaging that the Biden administration uh, are putting out, um, which is the very catchy target of, of 30 gigawatts by, by 2030. Um, one of the projects that's, that's waiting in the, wind, um, in the wings is, uh, is Dominion Energy's 2.6 gigawatt projects um, off the coast of Virginia. So I'm really pleased to, to have GT Hollett representing Dominion on the panel. Now, although offshore wind looks, looks like it's going to expand very quickly in, in the US, it's worth noting that right now there's only 42 megawatts of, of installed capacity uh, of offshore wind in, yeah, in the US. So compare this to 11 gigawatts in China over 10 gigawatts in the UK, it does suddenly seem as though the US has got quite a lot of catching up to do, but I do feel that that's actually poses huge opportunities to the US. It gives them the opportunity to learn from, from the successes, but also some of the mistakes made by the industry along the way. And uh, somebody who's arguably seen the most mistakes, mistakes defined as insurance claims perhaps, uh, is Matthew Yao. From, from Lloyd Warwick International. So yeah, very pleased as well to have to have Matt, Matt on the panel to uh, give his two pence in that area. Um, finally, to introduce Travellers and, and myself. Travellers have been around for 160 years and have earned a reputation as, as one of the best property casualty insurers in the industry. Um, Travellers first started insuring renewable energy assets in 1994 when we insured our the first US onshore wind farm. Uh, our US offshore credentials are also quite good um, in that we've, in, we've insured or supported both of those projects currently, currently in the US. Um, we have a dedicated practice, practice for, for renewables in the US and in the UK. Uh, we provide so specialist insurance to, uh, to worldwide risks and offshore wind naturally makes up a big part of, of what we do. Uh, and I sit in the offshore wind team at Travellers in the in the London office. So, um, sorry, yeah, that was uh, quite a lot of me of me talking. When we've got far more interesting people uh, here on the panel, so let me just quickly do a, a better introduction or a more detailed introduction into into each of them. So, firstly, GT, uh, the Dominion Project Director for Offshore Wind, he oversaw saw the development and the and the construction for the 12 megawatt Coastal Virginia pilot. Uh, project and is responsible for the development, permitting and stakeholder engagement of the 2.6 gigawatt commercial project. Uh, Matthew Yao is a director of Lloyd Warwick International and heads up the power and renewable energy team there. He's an engineer by background and has worked in the offshore wind industry for, for around 15 years, predominantly dealing with offshore wind related claims in Europe and, and Asia and more recently in the US. And, and finally, Gary Eliff uh, joins us as Director of Commercial Operations, Digital Services at GE Offshore Wind, um, with over 13 years of, of energy industry experience um, in varying roles, uh, from sales to strategy and business development. Gary is uh, well-versed in, in supporting GE customers uh, to contract for wind turbine equipment and uh, service solutions to build out energy projects. So without further ado, the five risks that we want to speak about today or want to discuss as part of the panel is, is the Jones Act, uh, the supply chain, interstate dynamics, grid transmission and distribution, 
and and finally natural catastrophe so uh, kicking off uh, for those not familiar the jones act is a federal law dating dating back to 1920 and requires goods shipped between us ports to be uh, built in the us uh, to be owned by a us entity and to be crewed by the us the main issue is that there aren't any vessels uh, capable of installing wind turbines that are uh, that's us built so um we've got to yeah we we either have to use feeder barges or possibly use a different country as as the port the lay down port so um i guess as a real case example gt i mean you've you've just completed successfully completed the pilot projects in coastal virginia what how how did you how did you navigate it there Sure. So on the on the pilot project, as, as you mentioned, we actually did stage out of Halifax, Canada, instead of out of the U.S. Um, it, you know, it was feasible with a two turbine project that we could we could make those uh, runs between uh, different vessels. Right, scour vessel was picking up rock. The the installation vessel uh, did both foundations and uh, and wind turbine installation. So we sort of went in in steps. Uh, but obviously not um, not a preferred or efficient solution for a larger commercial grade, utility grade uh, sized project. Um, so, so although we did use that um, Halifax staging for the pilot, uh, certainly not the intention on the larger project. We're, we're exploring some of the some of the items you mentioned um, about uh, about different locations um, and. Uh, and constructing a Jones Act vessel. I don't know if you want me to jump right into that or, uh, or um, but uh, uh, happy to do so. Yeah, yeah. Why don't you um, talk yeah. about that? It's in the press. It's it's publicly sort of available. So yeah, if whatever you can say would be great. Yep. And and so you mentioned right, the Jones Act just adds this level of complexity uh, to to U.S. offshore wind um, that you know you're not I think, experiencing in other locations worldwide. Um, so, you know, the specialized vessels being not U.S. flag, not Jones Act compliant, uh, that forces ourselves and other developers to, uh, to look at options. Um, so we'll have some equipment on the commercial project uh, that'll get um, transported from uh, the Portsmouth Marine Terminal, which we, we announced a, a lease agreement with them recently to be a staging port. Uh, so it'd come out directly to the site from Portsmouth um, with... A Jones Act barge, if necessary, for some components. Uh, but then on the wind turbines, uh, Dominion through a non-regulated entity, so not not as part of the 2.6 gigawatt project, but uh, a separate operating entity in Dominion that's a merchant uh, uh, group, has uh, co contracted to build uh, a Jones Act compliant wind turbine installation vessel. Uh, name of that vessel is Charybdis. Uh, it would be, it is in construction as of the uh, fourth quarter last year, and it's expected to be in operation uh, in late 2023. Um, so it will be able to make um, the, run, the runs which Europe has sort of traditionally seen, um, you know, from staging port out to installation site without, without sort of be a, a, a part. Um, so that's... Uh, under contract to Orstad and Eversource for some of their contracts in the Northeast uh, when it first comes into service. And then our intent on the Coastal Virginia Offshore Wind commercial project, the 2.6 gigawatts, is to also employ that vessel. Now we do need to uh, go through a state regulatory process to show that it was a, a competitive procurement. And, uh, and we think you know, the data points with Orsted and Eversource will be helpful to show that. Uh, but uh, we would we would expect the vessel to come to our project in the third quarter of 2025 uh, to begin wind turbine installations through uh, through year end 2026. One thing that I I couldn't help but think, but is is why don't you think anyone else is is building? Uh, a, I don't know if you if if you have a have an answer to this, but. It seems to us in Europe quite an obvious solution in that a wind turbine installation vessel is bespoke, is purpose built to install these efficiently. I know that obviously having to use a US shipyard is going to be a bit more expensive, um, but it does feel as though maybe because I just look at it from the risk side that actually it makes a lot of sense to have a have a purpose built vessel. So 
why is Dominion still the only one who who's who's made that decision? Yeah, Johnny, I, I mean, I I can't speak specifically for others. I just like I can give you our perspective on uh, why we did. I, I think we realized early during the development of the pilot project, the two turbine project, um, that that wind turbine installation vessel is the right solution, right? And and sort of referenced it a little while ago. That that's sort of what you see typically. Um, versus having to rely on a feeder barge. Um, so for us, uh, we thought it was a benefit to the U.S. industry, right? Not only for our, our own projects, but for other projects up and down the East Coast, um, to have a purpose-built vessel uh, that'll minimize uh, that material handling offshore. Uh, and, and so, you know, counterparts uh, in the industry, like you mentioned, have been, have been doing it that way uh, for a reason over time, I think this uh, barge solution is, uh, is, is interesting um, from the standpoint that you can accomplish construction. I, I would just say that uh, from our standpoint, we're just looking to minimize um, you know, that risk of multiple handling and to try and use a, a, a proven methodology. Okay, yeah, no, so we are seeing the feeder barge being obviously there for if it's only Dominion that's going to be building one, it seems as though the feeder barge, and given the vast pipeline, we're going to see lots of projects using the feeder barge approach. Um, Gary, I mean, of the most of the equipment, I guess, that's going to be put up, that this is relevant for is the turbine equipment. Do do you have a particular view on on you know this having to having to have an, a, a, a separate, well, an, an additional offshore lift? Every sort of a, every operation offshore now has to be taken from a feeder barge onto a non-US flagged specialist vessel um so that's yeah double the amount of work for sure and, and i mean grant hit on this as well but i'd say even just a step back you went through the five risks we're going to be looking at today it's it's funny that we can only pick five but we know there's a lot i mean you mentioned this industry is growing the u.s is set to explode and as we think about the myriad of challenges that we face the best solutions aren't yet known so when you asked you know why haven't more folks moved to U.S. vessels? Well, there isn't necessarily a proven best solution yet. When we look at you know, how we do the turbine installs, it's similar like you mentioned. We wanna minimize double handling, but we also need to look at the you know, overall economics of the project too. Okay. Um, I mean, Matt, I, I, obviously it's early days when it comes to feeder barges. It's not really employed in, in Europe. And I don't think like maybe only in shallow water when they can't have a, uh, yeah, they can't fit the, a vessel that close to shore. But I mean, have you, have you seen any issues with, with this approach in real life? In, in reality, it's an additional action that needs to happen, which otherwise wouldn't. Um, but I think this speaks to a sort of wider issue, which is, you know, sort of bottlenecks in supply chains. And whether you're talking about vessels, whether you're talking about cable supply, et cetera, or components coming from Europe or the rest of the world, any bottleneck in supply chain will have one effect, and that is to drive up sort of overall cost timelines and, and pricing. So anything that can be done to relieve such a, you know, such a matter is, is obviously um, preference. Vessels are huge investments. You know, they, they require long foresight. Because, you know, you, you sort of amortize this over a 20-year period or however long you, you, you know, you, you, you account for these vessels. And we're talking, you know, fairly sizable, you know, a, a typical a cable lay vessel or a jack-up vessel could be a hundred million investment. Um, so that's, that's a lot of money to, to put into the pipeline. Um, what we've also seen in, in Europe, and we've learned some sort of hard lessons over, over the last decade or so of offshore wind development, is we came from a, a space where we didn't have a lot of contractors with a huge amount of experience in, say, laying cables. We had a lot of telecoms people, we had um, oil and gas people, etc. But laying into array cables, infill cables for offshore wind is, is quite a different challenge. You know, you're fairly tidal constrained, you're fairly shallow water, you're doing lots and lots of repeat operations. And the sort of experience from, say, the telecoms wasn't that transposable onto offshore winds. And, and that meant that in the early days, at least, you know, we saw a lot of workmanship issues, um, a lot of hard lessons learned, which unfortunate to say we are sort of over that hurdle now. Um, you know, we don't see as much of these sort of workmanship type issues now in, in Europe. 
Um, we're being plagued more by design related issues and I'm sure we can touch upon you know that design aspects um, later on uh, today but but certainly the you know insurers have paid a lot of learning money uh, in terms of getting that competence um, and and you know having a crew and a vessel work together and have that experience of working together doing that task is critical in managing and mitigating risk I believe yeah no I, I yeah I, I agree with you and I think that we will see, won't we? I mean, as, as, as Gary sort of said as well, at, at the moment, it does come down to economics and it's, and it's always, it always has done, to be honest. Um, it does seem as though there's, in the first few projects, will probably receive the, the biggest sort of subsidies and, and maybe they, ha they have the ability to, to take these sort of extra sort of precautions. But as we know from Europe, as, as subsidies dwindle, um, you'll notice that the operations or the sort of operations they do tend to be a little bit more risky. Um, and, and, and that's necessary. And I will say the one thing, if, if you think about, you have to project forward to what vessels are going to be utilized in the future. If I think about my experience in onshore wind, that cycle is a much shorter period of time. Whereas in offshore, we're trying to project already to projects that are out in 2025 to 2030 to 2035 for these vessels. What are those turbines in the future going to look like? such as a vessel manufacturer, how do I proof what I'm making to make sure I get my, my return on investment holistically? So there's, it's right. It's trying to solve an equation with multiple variables. Correct. Yeah. No, I mean, when I started grand, the offshore. Grand smile in there. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you, you're right. Turbines were, when I started, 3.6 megawatts, which those were the ones being installed. And, and Matt probably saw much smaller ones going in, <laughs> onshore turbines going in. Um, we've grown yeah. so much and, and these vessel contractors yeah i mean they generally want to keep the utilization nobody wants a vessel sitting in in, in dry dock doing nothing you know you want to keep the vessel utilization 70 80 percent you know to, to, to be able to make it worthwhile so you really do need to be able to almost have a future gaze and horizon view to see well okay what is the utilization what are the projects you know what are the demands going to be and generally you know Developers don't want to do works during winter time. You don't want to be installing cable during winter time. You don't really want to be changing out main components during winter time. So the busiest seasons are going to be sort of your spring and summertime. And if you've got a, a, a tight bottleneck of available suppliers and, and vessels in that time frame, then it's going to sort of add to costs. Uh, and that's just something we, we need to sort of be attuned to when we look at this issue. Hmm. Well, I'm going to, uh, I'm just mindful of the time. I'm, go I'm going to move on to some questions are rolling in, which I, I think, unless it fits perfectly in, which I'm not, isn't quite the case now, I'll, we'll, we'll save some space at the end at, for, for the ones which I think are, yeah, um, hit, we'll, we'll make the most out of the panelists' sort of expertise. Uh, so the supply chain was the next thing that uh, I wanted to discuss in, in terms of a, a risk to to the US. Uh, at the moment, the vast majority of the supply chain uh, that's going to be used for US offshore wind is, is coming from coming from Europe, as that's where the established sort of fabrication yards are. Um, there's obviously, a, a, for the US to be competitive and to bring down that LC or that levelized cost of energy, there'll need to be a supply chain sort of established in the US locally. Um, uh, so, I just, yeah, if I, if I look to you, Gary, first, at the moment, GE turbines will be made in France. Um, although I suspect as a, as a US supplier, there's going to be quite a lot of demand for, for your stuff over in the, in the States. So what are the plans there? I mean, are you happy with, with, with the way that everything's working in, in Europe or, or, or do you think that there is going to be a push to just to, to open up new facilities? First, I'd just say, you know, if I look at the offshore industry in the U.S., it's clear they're looking to grow as an industry and then also revitalize. And lots of states focus on what's the investment spends, how many jobs am I creating? It's not just about the levelized cost of green energy. It's about also how can I revitalize some of those areas. With that, we also see a lot of the procurement RFPs focus a percentage of the reward based on localization. So across both from suppliers and developers, it's an important facet to continue to consider. Um, as you continue to grow and you look at the 
amount of projects that will be coming online, looking at not just a global supply chain, but a local supply chain will be really important. I mean, absolutely. And I suppose this is going to be quite close to, to GT's heart really is as, as a sort of Virginia centric state regulated utility, I, I guess GT, you've got um, your eyes on, on, on local content and, and supply establishing a supply chain in, in, in Virginia. Is that correct? Yeah, Johnny, you're right. I mean, so, um, so the basis of the regulated projects that we're putting in is this Virginia Clean Economy Act, right, which was passed here um, in, in 2020. Now, we don't have a firm uh, target like some of the other states in the U.S. have about percentage of local content with dollars, but that, uh, that legislation does uh, look to us to help with economic development, job creation, uh, et cetera. So those, those pieces are in there as we take uh, this commercial project in for our regulators approval. Um, they'll be looking to see what we're doing to help support, uh, just like you're saying, local content, economic development, jobs here in the area. So one of the advantages we have with Hampton Roads, right, is it's, it's, it's fairly well set up for uh, an offshore wind hub or supply chain. Um, right. We don't we don't we have deep water access. Uh, there's no overhead restrictions to get into the, the main port of Virginia sites and some others. Uh, we've got that experienced maritime workforce and, and some space to, to do these. Right. And I mentioned the Portsmouth lease that that we announced with them uh, several weeks ago. Um, so what we're looking to do is with the, the vendors, the tier ones, the folks that we're uh, negotiating with on uh, on the project. Uh, to explore those opportunities uh, about what content could come over here domestically. Uh, and, and to your point, looking to drive down ultimately levelized cost of energy. Um, so some of the early projects, like, like you mentioned, I mean, there's, there's going to continue to be a, a, a reliance on uh, some of the European fabrication uh, facilities. Uh, but the, the thought is that you, know, you, you start adding up an order book between a project like ours, you know, some of the other projects up and down the East Coast, and then then it's uh, then it opens up that ability um, for a manufacturer to make the decision to come. Uh, but we're also very focused then on the halo effect out to second and third tier suppliers, right in, into those main suppliers, uh, because that could generate a significant amount of economic development too. So um, you know we we've been active with local folks and regional and state economic development and workforce. Uh, organizations here to uh, to try and make sure we can take advantage of that and bring those facets to the project uh, as it comes online over the next few years. Absolutely, I think I think typically we do see a, a phased approach. Normally, I know Taiwan um, adopted a, a, maybe a quite a clear um, strategy of of allowing quite a lot of experience sort of European contractors to go over there in the first few projects, and over time. Uh, there was an increasing sort of demand on, on the local content. It'll be interesting to see, clearly Virginia haven't mandated such a thing, but it will be interesting, I guess, going back to Gary's point on v revitalizing certain certain industries um, and certain areas, then it's, it's quite a clear win for the states. And I'm gonna not go into that too much now, because I think that sort of, we will talk about that in interstate dynamics. Um, but from, yeah, from the underwriting side, I think it's safe to say that we're sort of in two minds really when it comes to the, the supply, because of, on one side, we like the fact that everything is going to be made in these sort of facilities in, in, in Europe in the, in the short run, which, which have experience sort of people operating them. And I suppose hopefully the quality assurance and quality control processes are, are up to scratch. Um, and then no sort of teething issues. The issue, the, although the other issue is that you've suddenly got to transit the whole, well, across the Atlantic, which adds a lot of lead time and a big sort of marine cargo risk. Um, the alternative is is setting up sort of facilities in, in, in the US. And I suppose there is always an element of of risk in that when, when you've sort of just tooled up a brand new facility to make sure that everything that comes off the production line is, is, is exactly how how you want it i mean it's a similar risk when you develop a new turbine and the first time it comes off that production line you might see that some things you hadn't planned in the design start to come through i mean matt do you 
do you have any sort of points you'd like to make when it comes to this element? I mean, firstly, I think local content requirements, job creation is absolutely key for mm. renewable energy and the roadmap for renewable energy. It's, you know, job creation is bipartisan. It doesn't matter who's in charge at the moment. If, you, if you're creating jobs and local content, then it will secure that future. And essentially, investors need that, that security before they want to sort of jump in on, on offshore wind. So I think it's, it's an important point and absolutely a requirement. Um, in Europe, we, you know, we've seen a, you know, a steady flow of design and uh, manufacturing type claims on, on, on the whole in offshore wind development. And you know, when we look into deeper into the data and the statistics, what we find is that often or not, you know, it's, you'll have the same operator who's done the same job for you know, 20 plus years. He reads the machine. It's an analog machine. There's no digital readings, you know, just by feel and sort of taste and smell and, and, and what have you. And then all of a sudden he retires and then, you know, you train in a new operator and then you start to see sort of uh, QA, QC issues start to creep in. So there's, there's, there's that part of it, which, you know, we, we need to try and iron out, you know, we need to make sure that we have this very robust um, quality assurance, quality control checks um, in, in any sort of new facilities, new production setups. Um, and you've touched upon the sort of uh, the transportation risk and navigation risk as well. You know, we have very heavy local content requirements in, in the UK and Europe as well. So we may be producing jackets in Jabba Ali in United Emirates, and then we will part fabricate them and then ship them across to say Harland and Wolf in, in Northern Ireland and finish them off. Um, you know, that's an additional transit risk and, and additional risk, which otherwise you wouldn't, you know, need to, need to see. Um, so that's something that underwriters obviously need to be very aware and attuned to. Um, and it's something that obviously in the US, it's, it's, it's even, you know, a greater extent, um, given, given the distances we're going. Yeah, I mean, marine cargo risk is, is it something that we, we do have to manage. And, and I think the marine warranty surveyor typically is, is, is playing a really key role in that. And, and that will continue in, in the US. I mean, that's a, that's a function which which is there to stay and I think for all the right reasons um, but absolutely we have to go in with our eyes open and at the moment you know five years ago not much was made over in Asia and now a lot is made of the Middle East in Asia and, and you know that that's what we need in order to sort of I guess establish offshore wind as a as a viable energy source that no longer requires government support and and that's exactly as, as you say that's the aim of the game and job creation is a byproduct of that and a very important one yeah. Um, going on, I suppose, yeah, the interstate dynamics, then it, it does dovetail very closely with this. Um, when we look in Europe, we're very used to looking at, if I think of Belgium, I, I know roughly what, what their targets are. I, if I think of Germany, I know what they need to do. Um, and I know what sort of system they have in place for achieving that. When we look at the US, I think to the layman, or at least to me, uh, you expect every, every, every well, the US too will be the same, but that's obviously not going to be the case. I mean, this has got a federal and a state element to it. Um, the one thing I guess that that is the reason why I've sort of chosen this as a risk is because I worry that if everybody, if every state decides that they need their own port, so if Portsmouth gets very heavily invested in, I saw it in the news yesterday, New Jersey is going to have a load of investment in their port, in the New, in the New Jersey port. Do we need, and I'm not saying it's going to go this way, but do, does every state need a specialist port? I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd argue not, but every state seems to want to be seen as, as, as the home of offshore wind and the one sort of holding the flag and, and having the, the greenest economy. And yeah, so I, I guess I'm looking mostly to Gary and GC here because you're on the ground, you know about it much more than much more, much more than I do, um, and I think I speak on behalf of most of our European guests. Uh, Gary, do you have a do you have a view on 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 how states are likely to work together? I mean, is that something that's been talked about? So, Johnny, you you hit on it. It's number one. What does the volume look like over time to ensure that any of these upgrades or localizations can be fully utilized? and appropriately developing business plans based on that timing expectations. Uh, as a supplier, much like when you're looking at the vessels, we have to consider the demand in the future 
and ensure that it can be fulfilled. So we're not going to be able to build full localization in every state. Yet, to your point, many states are looking for that. So to date, it's uh, almost a bit of a competition. Um, you know, where will the localization play out over time in the U.S.? And it's a continued conversation for sure. Okay. All right. It, it, it'll be interesting. I don't know how, how many conversations happened in Europe, to be honest, about this, but I know that if we think about a port or if we need a, a port, the UK, or at least pre, pre-Brexit, I'm not entirely sure how it, how it would work now, actually, but they, we could use the port of Rotterdam or the port of Esbjerg in, in Denmark, and there's no need to have our own specialist one, and arguably the UK doesn't really have one, which is interesting given that, as I said earlier, uh, we're second on the list of the of installed offshore capacity uh gt have, have you got any yeah what, what, what's your take on it yeah so maybe a, a couple facets a bit building on what what gary was saying too right like i mean you're not going to build um the same component manufacturing facility in multiple spots up and down the east coast is is my general impression right so you're going to have you know some of these major components um shifting around but I think you also looking bigger, you know, with, with the goal of the 30 gigawatts by 2030 that, that the Biden administration has out to us. So states all have different goals and they are competing to try and get uh, some of these jobs to come into their economy. Uh, but I also think down in Virginia, um, we've also got an approach between our governor in Virginia uh, and also the governors of Maryland and Carolina about a regional approach, right? So to your point, you don't need the same thing in, in all three states, but if we work collaboratively, knowing we all have projects off of our coastlines, uh, it, you know, you, you can bring economic devel- development to the region versus the individual states. Uh, so I think it's, it, it was a, a nice move by our um, state governments to set that up. Uh, but again, the, the crux of it is that uh, like, like I think Matt, or Gary said earlier, right? We want to drive down that levelized cost of energy, right? Being able to move that supply chain uh, where it's reasonable into the states helps accomplish that. Uh, but then it also, folks are absolutely looking for that job creation and that workforce uh, ability. So I think trying to take a little bit different lens down here in sort of the mid-Atlantic uh, about how we can still bring uh, multiple um, economic development opportunities to these three states and all benefit from it with reduced transportation and, and then the onshore upside too. That's interesting actually I, I didn't I didn't realize that and it does feel like that would be if, if more states can sort of form a cluster and, and and discuss that in a I don't know whether it's a semi-binding way um, that would be a it would it would be a reasonable approach I think obviously the distances in the US are just so much greater than than we're used to that obviously there will be there'll need to be more ports than just sort of one along the eastern seaboard but definitely can see why why they met their sense in in working together this this is a i I suppose again the three topics in the middle actually all go all go together very nicely so the grid transmission and and the infrastructure the grid infrastructure and and transmission is also something which i think has at least in my view possibly been overlooked in 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 setting some of those targets and when i was well i guess prepping for this uh i i saw that one article and i don't know how, how how reliable this is but one article said that it's not possible to have 30 gigawatts because the the grid can't take it and you know then i sort of got me thinking well we have nine years before that target probably needs to be achieved because it's quite a, a bold and, and well-publicized target. Um, is, 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 there, is, is there truth in that? I mean, does, uh, how, how much do you know? I guess starting with you, GT, sorry, you've just, you've just been, but um, obviously with, with the Virginia sort of, well, being a state regulated utility, again, I feel like you probably have the ear to the ground on this. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I have not, check the metric like you were just referencing, Johnny, about the 30 gigawatts and, and where that might connect. Because I think it'll be dependent on, you know, which projects come on in which order to some extent, right? Because 
what, what we have in Virginia, we are, uh, you know, the sister part of our company is the regulated electric uh, transmission and distribution entity. Um, but we are a part of a regional uh, organization, mul multiple states. Um, and, and so that when we bring a project like our 2.6 gigawatt project, and you, you file the developer, right? Different side of the company that I'm on versus the electric transmission. But we would file the project and then the regional transmission operator studies the project, right? And it, it triggers in many cases for a large influx of new power generation, uh, a, re a review and network up grades, right? That might not be at the direct point of interconnect. Um, and, and the reason it's, I think, creating a bit of a challenge in the U.S. is with offshore wind as non-dispatchable, right? I mean, we are subject to when the wind is blowing and what that wind speed is to, to how much power is coming back to shore. Um, so then they're having to take some grid management uh, processes, right? So what happens? If you have a relatively rapid increase or decrease in power, how they're balancing the grid through different uh, generation types. Um, so that is, I think, a, a large impact on the influx of offshore wind uh, into some of these coastal uh, communities and then getting it into higher power, uh, higher voltage transmission. So uh, I would say there, the, the, the pace and, and amount of discussion about like multi-region planning to make sure that we could hit that Biden goal is picking up. Uh, but it is a little bit of the chicken and the egg discussion that you hear, right? So you, you, I think we wanna have some scenarios there uh, about how to get this in. But at the end of the day, it, it becomes very dependent on where the actual uh, delivery of the power is on. Shore. Right, I, I, okay. So, so Gary, when we caught up, uh, uh, a few weeks ago i mean you, you and your colleague were saying that there's there does seem to be movement in at federal level now um to sort of push certain uh certain bills through is, is, is that right in order to sort of look as, after as some of the infrastructure plans they are looking at you know support in that segment but just to take one step back and this hits on the interstate dynamics piece as well when you're thinking about grid it's difficult for a state to look just within its own grid versus looking at the full system. Um, it's something that even though it seems many years out, I do think is a really critical piece of needing to do full system studies to understand the phase impact as you inject these large projects, to understand what sort of upgrades are needed, et cetera. Um, also, when you think about the asset of the wind resource to the grid, is it coincident with peak? Is it off peak? Do you have different wind regimes that can uh, play against each other to help level load that, et cetera? So even though it seems further out, I do think it's really important. You know, at GE, with one of the broadest renewable energy portfolios, we have a business grid and energy consulting. And it's something that, you know, we pride ourselves in being able to work together as well to help solve some of those problems as they arise. Right, and I guess that's kind of how we how we've learned in 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 Europe as well, haven't we? Um, as Matt, you you mentioned actually on the yeah. phone to me the other day about interconnectors. It, it, exactly. So, sort of how we've sort of dealt with this problem in Germany and UK in particular is in Germany we have Tenet essentially, and they will build everything, including the grid connection, basically your source to power, basically. And then a developer like, like Grant will come along and say, right, we're going to plug in and connect at this point. Um, and that's kind of taken out all of that regulatory dealing with the local state, the grid connection, all, you know, finding the brownfield sites where they come to land, you know, old power stations, et cetera. That, that deals with all of that. And you, it means that the developer doesn't need to worry about that side of it. And that, that's worked in Germany. The UK model is, is similar in the sense that the developer, though, will build the grid connection, build, you know, the wind farm, etc. But then they will sell the transmission assets over to a registered offshore transmission owner, an off -tow. Um, And that's so, again, we have that kind of central body that can regulate that. And because you do need to regulate it because we, you know, renewables in general is not base load. Um, you know, you, it's, it's a combination of, of factors that you need to balance out the grid. And, and Interconnectors is another way that we can achieve that. And, um, you know, in the UK, we use 
a, quite a fair few interconnectors. We use Norway almost as a battery. We use France as a battery. Um, you know, if the wind is blowing strong up in Scotland, we, we, we send power one direction to Norway. They pump hydro back up their dams. When the wind isn't blowing, they let the hydro back down the dams and, and the, the energy goes back the other way. And having that interconnection, I think, is incredibly important. And, you know, we saw with the big freeze that happened in, in Texas that, you know, the, the dangers of not having grid interconnection, you know, you can have rolling brownouts and, and nobody wants that. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a steep lesson. So just an, I, I guess it's another example of where the states will need to be very aligned and, and talking to one another, as sort of GT alluded to with um with, with the ports and, and, and key infrastructure there. Um, moving on, I guess, because we're actually quite quite short on time, uh, or at least I want to give plenty of time to the topic of natural catastrophe, because this is something which I think is 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 a new element or is a new risk to the established offshore industry. Uh, you know, offshore winds have started in Europe where there's pretty benign nat natural catastrophe exposure, maybe a North Sea storm every one in 200 years, but nothing compared to, to sort of hurricanes and well, name wind storms and, and winter storms and nor'easters uh, and, and earthquakes in, in California. I've seen one question pop up which sort of talks about um, California and West Coast. Uh, it's not really about a cat actually, but um, I think I think the just, just to sort of head that off, I think we're going to try and focus on the eastern seaboard here because it does seem to be the, the most pressing and the most real um, growth opportunity in the US. Um, and in a year's time, I'm sure we'll come back and do one on, on the West Coast. Um, but yeah, no, so the offshore wind industry hasn't really had to deal with CAT yet. I mean, we've, as, as I mentioned earlier, it's moving to Taiwan and, and Taiwan does have earthquake and, and windstorm or typhoon exposure. Um, Matt, you see things go wrong, I suppose, to put it to put it crudely. Um, do you see? Ha, have you got any real case examples of, of when a windstorm does hit hit a, a wind farm? So, so fortunately, Touchwood. I mean, like you said, we we don't see NatCat in in Europe um, as much. In Asia, in East Coast, it's certainly something that you know we need to be alive to, and, and I'm sure Gary can add to. But we're starting to see sort of. T-rated, typhoon-rated um, turbines, you know, stubbier blades, uh, deeper foundations for soil liquefaction and earthquake risk, and etc. You know, to use a case study, um, we looked at, say, Puerto Rico um, when Maria rolled through, you know, as a, as a Cat Five storm. You know, these are onshore turbines, but you know, onshore turbines, um, some fared very well against Maria, some didn't fare so well, and and sort of. What struck us the most when we're looking at the differences in the projects is that it was not so much the wind storm itself, i.e. high wind speeds that really were caused a lot of the problems. It was the storm surge taking out, you know, the prepper, the Puerto Rican power authority, the, the local um, uh, stations, etc., which meant that a lot of turbines near, you know, near the storm surge, which were flooded out, basically couldn't yaw, couldn't go into sort of shutdown measures, couldn't feather the blades, um, et cetera. And they, they, they fed very poorly against some more inland turbines, which actually were able to kind of face into the prevailing uh, winds conditions, feather the blades, stall out, et cetera. They actually did remarkably well. You know, we had a couple of doors blown open, uh, a bit of site flooding, but other than that, they were, they fed remarkably well. And I don't know whether we can, we can extrapolate from, from that data, but I'm sure um, Gary can, can maybe add some context in, in terms of GE what they're doing but that's something we noticed well ex ex exactly gary what uh, it has just been rated t class the ge aliad x um which 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 is great news i mean how, how what, what does that really mean though i suppose you know what's what's changed so um you know the aliad x has been designed to withstand extreme weather such as hurricanes um, and when the hurricanes approach, like Matthew had mentioned, the turbines are shut down, the blades feathered to minimize the impact of the force winds as much as possible. Um, we have received the typhoon certification and with obtaining that DNB certificate, we've proven the Hollywood X can reliably withstand typhoons and similar extreme winds. What's more important to look at though, is we also do individual site assessments on any projects we've looked at. And thus far, um, when we consider the Northeast, 
okay on the hurricane assessments. So the and it, so to get the T class certification, is is it just numerical analysis? It's it's modeled. It's not. It hasn't survived one yet. As, as in, it hasn't had one. It hasn't faced a, a windstorm. Is that right? Yeah, it goes through the certification process, which is um, analysis and rigorous testing. I don't have the the details of the exact rigor. I wouldn't um, understand. I wouldn't do <laughs> know how you know the in terms of an active yaw, our system works and ensures that it continues to remain feathered um, to reduce loads when in those conditions. I think that's. I mean, having looked at, at projects in in Taiwan and 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 Japan, actually, I think that's that's something that underwriters do look at you know is there is there some sort of battery maybe up tower that can that can make sure that even when the grid's out and and it can't get any auxiliary power from the grid because there does need to be power flowing in the other direction to take care of some of the key sort of turbine controls um that it's able to do that and exactly there's no there's no chance of it not being able to feather the blades and pitch into the wind or your yeah you're into the wind and pitch the blades um uh, GT, I mean, as an underwriter, I suppose I look at the Eastern Seaboard and I, I, I get, and especially as one that doesn't know much or hasn't really experienced CAT in, in, in the UK, I look further down and I see Virginia sort of further south, I suppose. Um, and then you've got a 2.6 gigawatts site. What sort of things would you do there to, to sort of stave off any, any issues with, with the CAT risk? Some of it's been mentioned, Johnny, right? So, so what we have done um, on, the, on the pilot turbines and then we're extending for the commercial project is we did um, a study of historical so storm data in that lease area. I mean, it goes back 100 years. I realize you can't guarantee it won't happen tomorrow. Uh, but, but the lease area that we're in was actually selected to, with, with an eye toward uh, minimizing those, those high wind named storms that come through the area. Um, so, um, the other, but we're also looking at wave action, by the way, right? The wave action with the wind, right? So both mm. in the structural design and then, as, uh, Gary and Matt have mentioned, right? With the, uh, the ability to feather the blades, you all, the turbine to, to reduce that stress. If we do have a high wind, uh, event, um, you know, we got the, like any turbine uh, cutout speeds where you, you go into that preservation mode. Uh, and we are um, including the battery back self-sustaining option uh, with our turbines uh, for just that just that reason to try and buy down the risk. If there is a, a disruption of, of power, you've got that battery uh, ability to help continue to uh, control the turbine. Um, so for us, I mean, that that's sort of been the focus here in the Virginia operating area, you know, historical study. Uh, type certification and specking on the turbines and then the battery backups, um, which, which we think bring a pretty strong case to reducing the risk. Um, yeah, highest wind gusts we've seen at the pi pilot turbine and we're almost at a year of operation. Uh, it'll be in about another month, mid-October, but the highest wind gust we've got is 65 miles an hour in that one year, well, 11 months right now, but Right, that's good. Okay, that, that that bodes well. I mean, obviously, it's a pretty small sample, but right. yeah, it's it's encouraging stuff. And I, I would I would need to mention as an underwriter that when we do our estimated maximum losses, and Matt's touched on this, it's not always to do with the turbine because they're a mile apart. You know, they're they're getting the bigger they get, the further apart they are, and actually, the spread of risk is is much better. That's how we see it. Then one of the biggest risks is when they're all sort of lined up on the on the key side during construction, just about to go out. And I know that this is managed by not having all of them there, not all sort of 62 or whatever it might be, um, a lot more than that for 2.6 gigawatts, but um, I guess just suitable sort of flood defenses. But if money's gonna be pouring or investment's gonna be pouring into this, these ports and upgrading ports for offshore wind, I have no doubt that, that it's gonna sort of be going in that direction too. There was one question here about, I guess, winter storms and 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 how that, uh, what is being done to categorise winter storms that are greater threat to the northern lease areas. Um, I guess we've sort of discussed that in terms of we will be electing to use T class turbines and seeing it as a as a NAT cat exposed area. Is that right? Sorry, Johnny. What's the exact question? Winter. 
question yeah what, what is being done to categorize winter storms which are great which are a greater threat to the northern lease areas than hurricanes in terms of the magnitude and the frequency of high wind speeds yeah i mean i think it's just a continued look at any individual site assessment so it's hard to probably generalize that but i know we will look at the full conditions of a site analyze that and also consider what additional options the turbine may need to be equipped with. Mm, I think, yeah, the wind speeds is, luckily that sort of exists, I suppose, in T-class turbines. One of the issues that I can think of there with, with winter storms is the icing on, on the turbines. But again, that should come down to site-specific design. And, and I know that the Baltics have sp specific types of turbine available to them, which have specific sort of de-icing properties and yeah, I think I think that should be addressed. Um, I, I guess I'll enter this sort of the Q and A phase now because we've got five minutes left, and I'm expecting Luke to pop up at, well, hopefully not too soon. Um, there's a question here from Michael Carrington saying, uh, "Do all panelists feel the need um, or feel the Jones Act needs to be modernised?" I think I think I could just sort of head this off in that. I think it's recently gone to Congress and it's been refined to say that it absolutely does apply to offshore wind. So I think it's here to stay. In, in reality, view. I mean, the oil and gas industry has been lobbying against this for some time and they have far deeper pockets than the, the renewable energy space. And if they've not managed to, to make significant headway on this front, the, the likelihood of it being updated or changed on the green front is... Um, um, I think that very yeah. question hit on one of your earlier points, Johnny, of why haven't we seen a rush to build or consider these vessels before was weighing the consideration might something change over time? Because um, that would obviously impact the business decision. But as Matthew alluded, it's been here for a while and uh, the likelihood of it changing is, isn't looking so, so great. <laughs> Yeah. But I mean, imagine all of these sort of local content, you know, we're going to have shuttles, we're going to have CTVs running backwards and forwards, you know, it's going to create a lot of job, it's going to do exactly what it's intended to do and protect a kind of development in the US space. So it's a, it's a poison chalice. Yeah, exactly. You're, 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 you're right. I mean, it, what, what you might lose in terms of real core efficiencies and, and, and the really sort of rock bottom LCO, LCOE yeah. or one that at least can compete with with one where it's there's there's total freedom you will have that real stimulation in the um in the job market and yeah. and the local economy that's that's right um there's an anonymous um anonymous question here uh, the jones act will affect uh the array cable burial too that that's correct right because each time a foundation goes in it's a classified a u.s port so you couldn't necessarily take a european vessel from one to the other. Uh, Grant, what, what happened in, in coastal Virginia? Now, the, the, for, for cable lay, um, the Jones Act does allow you mm. to use um, the cable lay vessels for the installation of that cable. And I am not a Jones Act expert. I'd have to get other folks to give you a, a citation. Uh, but, but for instance, um, on, the, uh, on the pilot project, the two turbine project, um, I mean, we weren't having to go pick up multiple runs of cable, right? It was a fairly simple turbine to turbine to shore. Uh, but but that, that, that vessel was in and out of port for replenishments and, and, and such, um, and, uh, and, and laid and buried the cable. Perfect. That's, I'll consider that one answered. Um, I'll... So there's a, a question here from, from Tom. Oh, Luke's popped up. Uh, about vessels sort of being, is it possible to have uh, equipment or are there vessels and equipment from uh, the oil and gas base in the Gulf that could be repurposed, uh, made, I guess, made offshore wind viable? Um, has, has anyone heard about uh, that option? Go on, JT. Yeah, I, I was just going to mention, we certainly have that conversation with folks about um, US-based vessel operators that, that do have assets that were used for oil and gas and, and sort of think about uh, converting to be um, more appropriate for offshore wind. Um, I, I think I would imagine that those groups are also uh, reaching out directly to the, the larger TNI transportation installation 
uh, folks in the industry to try and supplement their fleets with uh, with with some U.S. Uh, options. Yeah, we've certainly seen the same in Europe, where we've repurposed um, dredgers, uh, rock dumpers into cable lay vessels. You know, look at Boscarlis, look at Van Ord, and, and and none of these had cable lay vessels before, and a lot of them have been repurposed from rock dumping and various other activities. Yeah, I did look into the the, the lift barge market, and and I, I think that 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 is a real constraint, and that the size of the deck just can't handle some of these um these blades and yeah. the cranes. We've we've seen cranes being upgraded in in Europe, but um yeah, I think it's a stretch too far for lift barges. But I feel it'd be like a shame. It, There's a lot of zombie rigs sitting there at sixty dollars a barrel, not doing much drilling right now. So, mm. well, and you know. For Beyond the construction period might be an opportunity there too, right? For uh, maintenance campaigns, uh, you know, Matt Matt mentioned it a little bit. The operations bases and and the you know periodic maintenance that's happening uh, on a daily basis for these large commercial scale projects, right? There's there's potential for those vessels to come in and support that, and it also gets you the local content, right? Like you don't want too far of a run from your ops base to your wind turbines obviously or you've got a lot of downtime with your uh, technicians so absolutely i think i think I'll, I'll i'll probably have to wrap up there um before luke gets in i just want to thank everybody for tuning in and i want to thank yeah, each of the the panelists for yeah thank you. giving unique insight to a really interesting and very exciting area i think that we've been talking about this for a long time but it does it genuinely does feel as though it's right around the corner now uh vineyard wind looks like it's it's going to go ahead at last and after that i'm sure it's going to all sort of snowball so um yeah over to you luke well thank you very much johnny for excellent moderation there and um thank you of course to our speakers and, and you the attendees uh, and travelers of course for partnering with reuters on this uh, excellent piece of content uh, what we'll be doing is sending this all out to you uh, the listeners uh, within a week to share this also with folks in the industry who would also be interested um, and I'm sure uh, a lot of you will want to get in contact so uh, do let me know um, if you have any questions and I can pass these on to our speakers also. Uh, thanks again and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Bye, -bye. Goodbye all. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers. Bye. Bye. -bye.